She's a sporting great. It's Gabby Logan. He's David's mate. It's Robert Webb. And their team captain, Lee Mack. And facing them tonight, he's the joker in the pack. It's Rob Brydon. He's a Channel 4 hack. It's Krishnan Murphy. And their team captain, David Mitchell. But first, please try to convey a convincing impression of complete spontaneity in appreciation of your host, Angus Dieter. Good evening and welcome to Would I Lie to You? A question to which the answer is, of course I would, this is the BBC. <laughs> if you look up the definition of lie online, it says it's a type of deception in the form of an untruthful statement, which is pretty rich coming from Wikipedia. <laughs> and estimates say that everyone lies on average twice a day, so I guess there must be a fair few people out there who aren't lying at all for Gordon Brown to be able to fit in all of his. <laughs> Oh, it brings us not a moment too soon to round one, the domestically titled Home Truths, in which our panellists take it in turns to read out a statement from a card in front of them. That card may contain a familiar truth or a scurrilous lie that we've made up on their behalf, and they're now reading for the first time, in which case they have about two nanoseconds to come up with a convincing story, so no pressure. Uh, commiserations then to Gabby, who is uh, first up. Thank Gabby. you, Angus. I have stolen sweets from Madonna's dressing room. Right. Well, I think the, the key is the context there. Why were you in the Madonna complex, uh, moving from room to room in search of sugar? <laughs> it was actually her dressing room at a concert venue. Could you be specific, or were you taken there blindfolded? <laughs> it was at a, a venue in London where she was performing. Could you be even more specific <laughs> than the city? The Brixton Academy. Right. Why were you around the backstage? Did you have a, it was the Brixton Academy? Accidentally, I found myself in the um, VIP party that was apparently right next to Madonna's dressing room. So I was walking out and looked in and saw this dressing room and just wandered in because um, I was intrigued. What were the sweets? The sweets were, um, you know those long red licorice things with sugar that are quite... Um, uh, quite sour, actually, when you when either they get the back of your mouth. I find this very hard to believe that the door wasn't manned I'm by. I'm disappointed tea. that you don't find it hard to believe that I would steal. No, I accept that straight away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't can't imagine. I mean, even if she asked for sweets, I don't think she'd ask for that sort of red licorice string. David, your verdict. You're the team captain. You have to come to decision here. I think we're we're moving towards lie, aren't we? Yeah, lie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, lie. you're saying it's lie. a filthy lie, Liar. Gabby. Truth it is lie? indeed the truth. Oh! 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 It is true, Gabby did steal sweets from Madonna's dressing room. Seems only fair. Madonna helped herself to a child from Malawi. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, your home truth, if you would. Right. I once simultaneously worked as both the DJ and the newsreader on local radio using a different accent for each job. <laughs> 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 I really hope this is true. <laughs> what, what were the two accents? When I was a DJ, I used to... I was younger, so I had kind of a higher voice, and I used to kind of talk a little bit like that and say, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> the newsreader, I would talk a bit more like that. So that's um, not the accent, that's, no, just, that's just, the just the tone. That's the tone, yeah, the pitch. Well, if, if you'd let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> I had a slightly Welsh tone. To, to the newsreader, because I am Welsh, and I would sort of give it more of a sort of Anthony Hopkins, sort of, uh, in other news coming in at the moment, there's been a horrific pile-up on the M4 motorway, ambulances are on their way there right now. I would just do it more slowly, <laughs> give it a slight more Welsh lilt. Did you ever have any banter between yourselves? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never did, no. What's the station again? BBC Radio Wales. Was this a time of great cutbacks at BBC Radio <laughs> Wales? Why couldn't they It's always afford... a time of great cutbacks at Radio <laughs> Wales. They Did couldn't you... afford a newsreader. Are they very expensive, Krishnan? Newsreaders? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of Krishnan doing that on television as well, just getting a wig on and running over to the weather. <laughs> <laughs> the first time it happened was, was sort of accident. It was when the, the newsreader didn't come in. It was a very early show. It was the 6.30 in the morning to 7.30. And the newsreader, one time, when there was snow, didn't come. And they said, will you read the news? And I did it for a laugh did it in a different voice after the jingle, which is not what they, they were saying, and then just kind of stuck with it. Did you read the sport? Uh, no, there was a sports guy called David Cartwright. Interesting they didn't give him the news job. 
We've already established, Gabby, that you are little better than a thief. So, <laughs> for you to sit there taking the moral high ground, when I stepped in to save a colleague who got stuck and couldn't make it in, frankly, is a bit rich. And I expect more support from a team captain than I'm getting at the moment. I'm getting nothing from this fellow who's sitting here reading my thoughts, going, I wonder what he's thinking right now. I can't. <laughs> Because frankly, David, now would be a good time to join in. <laughs> I, know it's, I know it's harder and harder to get impressions on the television, but uh, <laughs> this isn't the place. Um, I'm, tot I'm totally behind you. I would just like to publicly say how plausible I think everything that you've said <laughs> is. Uh, it's exactly what I'd have done in your position. Um, <laughs> No. So, Lee, you're going to have to come to a decision well, of some sort. I, I thought that was an assured performance, and I, I wish it were true, but I don't think it's true because it's... that would be silly. Yes. <laughs> what do you think, Gabby? I think it's a lie. Robert? I think it's a lie. OK, we think that's a lie. They're saying, saying a lie. They are saying it's a lie, In so fact, the truth, please. it's <laughs> a lie. It is a lie, well done. <laughs> Well produced. Uh, it is a lie. Rob did not simultaneously work as the DJ and the newsreader on local radio. To be a local radio DJ, you have to have enthusiasm, poise and the belief in your heart of hearts that Slough actually matters. <laughs> uh, next up, it's uh, Robert's turn to astonish us. My nickname at school was Mr Custard. <laughs> yeah. there you go. Um, your initial response. Why were you called Mr Custard? Can I just check? You two didn't go to school together, did you? No, no. it's not Ca quite carry that on. sick. No. But it was happened because of, because of this. Because uh, I, firstly, uh, I was very sick once on uh, some custard. Because I was at school... <laughs> on uh, some custard. On some custard. Right. Well, I was, <laughs> the custard made me sick, but there was some custard left. So I suppose, yes, yes David, I was <laughs> sick on some custard. You were sick right. custard on <laughs> custard. Yes, yeah. exactly. Right. Custard he mixed. sees custard, he sicks custard on it. That yeah. was the thing. That was the Mr. System. Custard. That was He'll the custardize any custard. custard. <laughs> How old were you? I was nine-ish. Oh. Yeah. Right. How long did it stick? How long did it stick? Yes, the, the nickname. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it was actually... It was relatively you know, every easy. Every person in this room thought you meant the custard. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Uh, for a couple of years, and then I changed school, luckily. So, uh, and then I, did, I cleverly didn't tell the new people. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of feel that people say children can be very cruel. Mm. And actually, wouldn't they focus more on the whole pukey, vomity element rather than the custom call you yeah. Mr. Sick or, or <laughs> Mr. Puke? Mr. But if, Mr. He was, yeah. if he was as charming so? at school as he is now, then I think they would focus on the custard. That's why I'm now coming around to believing his story. I'm both moved and delighted. <laughs> I, I'm kind of with you on that it's not quite cruel enough as a nickname. Uh, um, so, therefore, you're thinking... Uh, therefore, I'm thinking lie. I, I would go with that. I'll go, I'll well, go with the consensus say, and yeah. say lie. OK, team captain is saying it's a lie. So, Robert, time to confess. It's a lie. It is a lie. Well done. <laughs> And so we descend lead balloon-like into round two, the Ring of Truth, where I read out some extraordinary celebrity facts, and the panellists' mission, should they choose to accept it, is to establish the truth or otherwise of that fact. Lee's team have these words of wisdom to enjoy. Uh, some games magnificent, some other not so, uh, not so good. And, um, you know, omelettes, hex. You haven't got any at the moment. No eggs, no omelets. And depends on the quality of the eggs. In the supermarket you have eggs class 1, class 2, class 3. And some are more expensive than others, and some give you better omelets. So when, when the class 1 eggs, you know, are in waitress and you cannot go there, you have a problem. That, you know, he's launched fearlessly into this extended egg metaphor in a, <laughs> in a second language. And he's a football manager, not the most chatty, eloquent guys usually most of the time. And he start, he's kind of doing it, and then towards the end, he starts to, he starts to slightly smile. And it's kind of, <laughs> you know, sometimes I even amaze myself. <laughs> this, this is great.
And then you get the sound of those slightly arse-licky sports journalists starting to chuckling along, going, oh, Jose's off on one again. Oh, I love it when he goes off on one. Oh, he's brilliant. What a character. What a boring twat. <laughs> OK, here is the related fact, then. Uh, Jose Mourinho is about to release his own range of air fresheners. <laughs> the tagline for the advert uh, is that Jose's filling your home with a sweet smell of success. And the fragrances include uh, something called Scent Off and the special one. Scent Off? They've obviously put a lot of effort into the pun there. Yes. And the second one, they've just said special one. Exactly. The third one's probably stinks like a Norwegian forest. Let's go for a pint. <laughs> Beckham has his own fragrance, mm. and Sven yeah. had his own pasta That's sauce. That's body and, fragrance, isn't uh, it, Beckham? Yeah, Alex Ferguson drinks toilet duck. <laughs> possible. Anything's possible in this game. Uh, so, Lee, any idea? Oh, you're, uh, you're the football expert on this particular panel, so what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think, Gabby? Yeah, I don't think it's true. I just think it's too random. I mean, air fresheners. <laughs> I know. Okay, I'm saying it's a They're lie. saying it's not true, and it is, in fact, a lie. <laughs> right, right, well done. No, there's no slide on that. Yes, uh, Jose Mourinho is not about to release his own uh, range of air freshener. He was thinking about it, but uh, Roman Abramovich had just bought the world supply of air. <laughs> uh, Jose introduced a club dietitian and nutritionist at Chelsea, although Ashley Cole still likes to get stuck into a half time orange, or Cheryl Tweedy, as she's known. <laughs> And now for David's team, with a question about this somewhat surprising agony aunt, with the emphasis very much on agony. If you've got no ambition and you don't want to do anything, you might as well just go and lay in a ditch. To be expecting to go from where you are now, which is on the sofa, to halfway up the ladder. No, I don't. And you can't, you've got to begin on the first rung. But I'd rather be on the, the first rung of a ladder that I want to climb than halfway up a ladder I don't. OK, which is this ladder you want to climb? I don't know you. Pile me up in knots. Now, I really ain't got a scooby doo what you're talking about now. What do you want to do? I don't know. Bottom of a ladder that I so, so what, what ladder do you want to be on? But you don't know what ladder you want to be on. Exactly. Until you've tried different ladders, how do you know what ladder you want to be on? What are you doing about the window cleaner? The slight flaw in that programme is the message that if you work really hard, you can end up like an insane woman with lopsided tits and a crash helmet hairdo. <laughs> Here is your related fact. Uh, Anne Whittacombe relaxes by listening to an LP of lion and tiger noises from the jungle. <laughs> is that true, David's team? Well, I mean, definitely the possibility exists. I would sort of like to say, in defence of Anne Whittacombe, that the thing that's bad about her is all of her horrible views, not the fact that she's ugly. <laughs> You know, is that the best thing we can say about this, this woman who sort of voted against gay rights and horribly wanted to get into power and make us do horrible things? Mm. This evil person. And the only thing we can find to say about her is she doesn't look great. <laughs> you know, it is a bit like insulting Hitler because you don't like his moustache length, isn't it? Right. Or his hairdo. So, oh. or, or his hairdo, exactly. <laughs> which I, David my... didn't want to mention the hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't want to help your team, but the key words you want to be looking out for those is the LP bit. I mean, <laughs> I, there's something about the idea of being on an LP and going... <laughs> she would have a gramophone. I think that makes... <laughs> 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 I think this is undoubtedly true. Uh, are you going to overrule your teammates? Uh, I'm or not going to. Go I have them? absolutely no idea. Right. And Rob seems oh, I confident. Think I think it's a lie. I so, think it's a lie. You see? <laughs> your, your current view? I, I, I'm going towards a lie because I think the lion and the tiger bit is the thing that sort of... Right, if it was right. whales, m whale musical... You're, okay, I... Wait! I, I think it's true. Think it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with what you think I, now. Okay. It's a yes. It's a yes. It's a yes. Say no. Say no. Say no. <laughs> I would say lie. Um, he says no. He says lie. You say... It's no, no. lie. It's true. <laughs> Which is the right answer? <laughs> and Whittacombe does relax uh, by listening to an LP of lion and tiger noises from the jungle. They drown out the growls her stomach makes when she hasn't eaten for ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, nothing like hearing the sound of lion's jaws crushing the skull of a screaming wildebeest to send you nodding off. And on track five, side two, she feeds them an asylum seeker.
Which means at the end of this round, uh, well, neither team has the comfort of a lead, both tied together on three points. <laughs> Our next round is the inadequately titled This Is My. Lee's team will each claim to have a connection with tonight's mystery guest, but only one of them will be telling the truth. It's then up to David's team to spot the saint amongst the sinners. So please welcome this week's special guest person, Viva. <laughs> So, uh, Robert, what's Viva to you? Uh, this is Viva. She is my ex-girlfriend. She dumped me when I got her for Christmas a torch. <laughs> uh, Gabby, perhaps you'd like to explain how you know Viva. Yeah, um, this is Viva. Uh, she was my arch rival in rhythmic gymnastics. Uh, and finally, Lee, your relationship with Viva. This is Viva. She tried to teach me to swim when I was 30, but it didn't work. So there you are. A former partner to Robert, a rival gymnast to Gabby, or Lee's unsuccessful swimming coach. Who do you want to start with? What are, what are rhythmic gymnastics? Um, rhythmic gymnasts use ribbons, hoops, balls, clubs, ropes. So not proper gymnastics. Then. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of gymnastics which it has uh, its own beauty. <laughs> and and at what, at what level did you compete? Uh, we competed at international level. And, and you're still friends with her now? Um, yeah, we, we, we know each other, yeah. When did you last see her? Oh, um, a few months ago. Where? Um, just around the corner. Where? Just... What, in the street? Where? Just in... Just in uh, Where? In London. Where? <laughs> at, a, at a gym? Where, sorry, I've got this. Where we, in we... London? <laughs> Where in London did you see her? I saw her in a, in a restaurant in West London. Which restaurant? <laughs> She's uh, lying. Next. Uh, <laughs> Are you the same age then? Uh, Viva's actually about a year older than me. Yeah. <laughs> And, and uh, if you're friends with her, you would know uh, when she's due, because... Is she pregnant? Because I didn't like to say. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you just let yourself go. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, what, so you, were, you can't swim, Lee? Well, I couldn't swim when I was 30. I mean, how old are you now? I'm 39. 39. Well, I think you can say if she's been trying to teach you to swim for nine years. No, and she you hasn't still can't. been trying to teach me to swim for nine years. She tried to teach me to swim when I was 30 and she failed. Where did you have your lessons? Uh, in my hometown, Southport. I reckon he's lived, he's lived in London for more than nine years. He wouldn't have been in Southport nine years ago. So he How do you no longer have lived in London? Because, of course, you've been on the circuit. You've been around for a long Believe time. Believe it or not, you can live up north and still be on the no, telly. No, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> We've, we've got this thing that's just come up north called the car, and it's brilliant! <laughs> Why at age 30, yeah. what was it that made you think, I really ought to learn to swim? It's a good question, and I can answer that very simply. I, I moved to Brighton, and uh, I lived oh, in a flat that overlooked the sea. So, hang on, so you moved to Brighton, and you travelled to Southport to have your swimming lessons? Thank you, sir! You're done! You're done! <laughs> You should be on the bill. <laughs> now, when you're finished, can I continue the story? Yeah, yes. I don't think there's any point. At the age of 30, I moved to Brighton and I looked at the sea and I thought, oh my God, I'm terrified of the water. I'm moving back to Southport. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Why don't you join? Why don't you join Gabby in Liar's Corner? <laughs> <laughs> Rob, when did you go out with... with... Uh, this was uh, the... Well, in 1991, in between my school and university. What kind of torch was it? Then? Quite a cheap one. We, uh, we met at Gateway Supermarket, which was my after-school job. Uh, she was putting out a display of cheap uh, plastic torches. And, you thought, and I, thought, I thought it would be a funny joke uh, to give her that for Christmas, and it didn't go down as well as I'd hoped. And who dumped who? Viva jump, dumped me. It was partly through the, the torch. Also, it might have been something to do with the fact that I didn't go up to her uh, 18th birthday party because I hated all of her friends. Why did you hate all her friends? They were uh, boorish and irritating. <laughs> 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 
good. What did you learn from the relationship? What did you take um, away? To try and, uh, try and form relationships with people that are based on more than just sex and drinking. It's, it's... <laughs> you say you learned that message in 1991. Well, I, I tried to. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> it's definitely Robert because of the way that Viva is reacting when Robert is speaking. She's kind of going, oh, that idiot. <laughs> so I think Robert is telling the truth. Uh, can I also say that for a pregnant woman, those boots are ill advised? You say so. <laughs> you know, I say, back support, my love. You're ah, making problems for later on. But she was a gymnast, on. you see, so she's got very good core strength. Gabby, she's, oh, she's a not a gymnast. <laughs> She might actually, she that, she's not pregnant, it's a buoyancy aid. <laughs> <laughs> OK, David Steen, we need an answer. So is this person an no. erstwhile girlfriend from Robert's past, uh, Gabby's gymnastic opponent or Lee's swimming teacher? I think Robert is telling the truth because when he said that her friends were really boorish, he looked really quite nervous. Yes, about it. he did, yes. yes. <laughs> OK, I think we're going to say okay. Rob's telling the truth. It's Robert. Viva, perhaps you'd like to reveal who you really are. I was Gabby's oh! rival. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to Viva and thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so, at the end of that round, it's uh, David's team who are showing all the fighting spirit of the French, caving in as they have 4-3. <laughs> And so we come now happily to our final round, more disturbing insights from our panellists who yet again have no idea what's written on the card they're about to read. Uh, beginning with... <coughs> David. I believe disaster will occur if I don't adhere to my special alarm clock system. <laughs> what is this alarm clock system? <laughs> Well, the system is uh, that I have uh, two alarm clocks, one that plugs in and one on my phone, and I set them both at the same time, because historically I used to be quite a deep sleeper and it was difficult to wake up. One will usually go off first, even though they're for the same mm. time, because the clocks are independent, and I have to turn the other one off before it goes. What uh, kind of disasters do you imagine will occur? Uh, well, I, I, I imagine I might die, basically. <laughs> I imagine from... I might discover I've got a terminal disease, or I imagine whatever thing I'm most worried about. Are you following this? I'm totally so. confused. You've got two alarm clocks, yeah, one, one of them is plugged in, one of them's on your phone, mm -hmm. and the explanation for why do you do this is because I think I might get a terminal illness. Yeah, is there a big bit that yeah. I've missed out? Yes, there is. Uh, the, all the words I said in between those parts of the story. <laughs> that's, that's what you've missed out. <laughs> right. yeah. So, Lee, do you think there's any truth in this? I think we have to rely on Robert's knowledge of David for this. I think it's true. Yeah, you do? True. Yes. I've spent many years watching David try to leave the house without unlocking and locking and unlocking and locking the door seven or eight times, and so um, I believe he would have a system for waking up. <laughs> you are team captain. Definitely true. Definitely true. Okay. We'll go with true. You're saying it's true. Okay. David, reveal all. It is, in fact, true. <laughs> Yes, uh, David does believe that uh, if he doesn't adhere to his special alarm clock system, some kind of disaster will occur, like someone finding out he's got a special alarm clock system. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of sportsmen are superstitious too. Tim Henman, for example, had a lucky towel that he believed made him win tennis matches. He left it in a hotel room in 1993. <laughs> uh, next, Krishnan. I check for monsters before I go to bed because I'm afraid of the dark. How can that possibly be true? You read the news. Yeah, but there's lights on when he reads the news. <laughs> <laughs> Has this gone on a long, long time? Well, since I was very young. Does this happen every night? Every night before you go to bed, you check for monsters? It, dep it depends on whether I'm alone. Well, it's probably slightly embarrassing if you're not alone to check for monsters. Possibly. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a journalist. I do, I, you know, I travel. I'm, I'm on my own quite a lot. So, talk us roughly through. Are you in a hotel somewhere away from your wife? It's dark. That much we can pick I'm up. I'm in a hotel room. I, I'm on my own, yeah. um, as, I, as I generally would be in a hotel room. And um, <laughs> I would check uh, in the wardrobe, um, in, the, in the ensuite bathroom. Right. Because you never know what's in the shower. Yeah, um, I think you'd be pretty sure it's a pubic hair on the wall. 
the hotels I stay at, anyway. It's a, it's a certainty. Um, Lee, what are you veering towards? Are we saying not true? I, I really don't think Unanimous? it's true. Unanimous? Lie. Yeah. Unanimous, it's a lie. Okay. They're saying it's a lie, Krishnan. Tell us the truth. It's 100% true. <laughs> it is absolutely true. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Rob. Ah. You're on. Um, I was voted the 47th sexiest man in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the 48th? I think was John Humphreys, the uh, <laughs> guy who reads. Who, who made this part? Who was it? Uh... Wales has its own newspaper called the Western Mail. Have we asked him which year this was? Oh, yeah, which year was it? It was, <laughs> it was clearly not in the last ten. It was about... <laughs> <laughs> Listen to you, George Clooney. Um, <laughs> I could take that coming from Robert, who has a certain earthy charm. Right, thank but you. But from a rejected chuckle brother, it's a bit rich. <laughs> so, are you team captain, what are you saying? OK, we think that's a lie. Yeah. OK, they're saying it's a lie. Is it the truth or a lie? It's true. It's absolutely true. <laughs> Yep, it's true. Rob was voted the 47th sexiest man in Wales and would have finished even higher if he hadn't got cramp in his dialing finger. <laughs> uh, next, Robert. I was voted the 88th sexiest man in the world. <laughs> By who? By, it was the readers of some women's magazine. Which Blind one? and wretched. You would know. <laughs> <laughs> new, new look or new, new woman. Where did David finish? I'm not so very not, sure David not, was not, on that not listed, list. Not listed, unfortunately. <laughs> Generally, Robert is considered the, 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 the better looking one of your uh, outfit. But if it were me, I, can I say this, not in a gay way, but I <laughs> think that you are easier on the eye than him. <laughs> I think there's something very pleasing, and I, you may notice I've been looking at you a lot. <laughs> not, not in a gay way, yeah. but in a, in a, I just think he looks lovely. I feel a bit weird about this. <laughs> but, you know, thanks. Well, anyway, if we could drag you back yeah. to um, uh, um, the poll. I think it's, I, I think, I think it's true. Robert, the answer? It is true. Yay! It is true. Which uh, hyperactive buzzing sound means that at the end of tonight's contest, it's uh, David's team who've lied their way to victory, having thrashed these teams 7 6. <laughs> so, cheers and applause to our winners, cheers and derision to our losers. And um, we leave you with the thought that, according to Winston Churchill, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on, which suggests that while lies may travel faster, truth has been having a lot more fun. Good night. <laughs> Join me tonight for my last hour of the series, where my guests will be Disco Soul Legend and Shaka Khan, Style Guru Got One, Hollywood Star Steve Crowell, and we have great music from the Mighty Prime and Scream. That's Friday night with Jonathan Ross after the news at 10.35. Classic comedy in the Rook Restaurant, a gem from the Two Ronnies sketchbook, next on BBC One.